Hello, hello everyone. I hope everyone is doing well on this beautiful, beautiful day. Um, just, uh, we're going to get started with the session. Just want to say thank you so much for joining us today and welcome everyone. Um, we are excited to have Project Vocals third program today, which is the truth behind women in conservation, which is in conjunction with the International Women's Day and World Wildlife Day which both fall in the same month of March, which goes to say that, you know, the, the month of March is really an important month uh, for everyone. This program is fueled by the Global Environment Facility Small Grants Program, uh, which is under UNDP and led by Econites. So a little bit before we dive in into our exciting documentary today, uh, there's a few housekeeping rules that I would like to share with everyone. Um, first and foremost, this session will be recorded and published on our website and social media. So if you are, um, if you do not want to be featured, uh, we would appreciate it if you can turn off your camera. However, we would always appreciate to see your beautiful smiles and faces on our website and our on, uh, and also on our social media. We would also like to remind everyone to mute their call at all times so that we do not disturb the, uh, the session. Uh, an ongoing discussion. We would also like to inform the participants that all the questions during Q&A session will be sent via the chat box and will be addressed during our Q&A uh, session let, uh, later. There will be a quick photography session before the program ends and everyone is welcome to participate and turn on their camera after. And best and, uh, you know, the best part of this session today is that everyone here who participated will receive an e-certificate. And, you know, I know that means a lot, especially for university students. So without further ado, let's go, uh, let's go to um, our film screening uh, session, the screening part, uh, the film screening part of the session today, which is on the brink of extinction, the Malayan tiger by Lara Arifin. I'm very excited um, to introduce Lara, who is a Malaysian architect, and filmmaker. Her great passions revolve around architecture, history, and wildlife. Lara is also the founder of Rimau, an NGO that focuses on saving the Malayan tiger. She has won numerous awards and her films has, has been nominated, won, and screened not only in Malaysia, but in different parts of the world, such as Singapore, Spain, New York, South Korea, and many, many more. So, without further ado, I would like to welcome Lara to the virtual uh, to, to the virtual stage to share a little bit about her documentary on the brink of extinction, the Malayan tiger. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for such a wonderful introduction. Um, I'm very humbled by it. Um, just a quick little moment before we start the film screening. Um, so. Basically, you know, I, I trained as an architect, but became a filmmaker like one or two years after um, joining my husband uh, in this field. Um, you know, so we've been making, I have been making documentaries for more than 25 years now. And uh, my passion really is um, making films on conservation issues. Uh, and the last, five years, I've been really focusing my efforts on tigers, uh, on the Malayan tiger. I've also done a film not so long ago on the Sumatran tiger. So tigers are, are really something that I'm passionate about. Um, so I just wanted to share sort of an evolution to a certain extent. So, I've, you know, architect turned filmmaker, and now the latest thing that I'm really putting all my heart in is towards my new NGO, which Anis will talk about later, uh, Rimau. And uh, Rimau is really um, something that we set up because we were frustrated with the current situation on the Malayan tiger. So that's why Rimau came about. Um, but going back to the film you're about to watch. Um, the film was made in 2018. Um, it's called On the Brink of Extinction. And we worked with uh, WWF. Uh, so basically at that point in time, I think WWF were also frustrated that 
um, the situation was so dire. Uh, the initial results from the National Tiger Survey had come back uh, for Royal Balloom and Tamungo, and there was a drop of 60% of tiger numbers. So that was a devastating uh, shock to all of us. Um, so when we made the film, uh, we wanted to again highlight to Malaysians and people in politics at how dire our situation was. So um, I think WWF and Global Tiger Day 2018, I think it was Global Tiger Day, or was it? Yeah. Global Day. Um, we got uh, at that time the minister, uh, Xavier Jayakuma, to, to watch the film. And I heard that um, one of the things that he wanted to do after was to shoot poachers on site. Uh, <laughs> I think the film brought out uh, emotions of frustration even in him. Um, so I think without um, further ado, um, watch the film. It gives you a context of what was happening in 2018. A lot has happened since. Uh, 2018, all on the positive side of doing more. Um, and, and I hope to say that the film was almost like also helped to, to bring awareness at the current situation and how we needed to move urgently. And, you know, we couldn't, we can't wait anymore for the Malayan Tiger. So Anis will be talking about Rimao later on. Uh, to all of you, and I hope that you enjoy her, her talk about the work that Rimao has done since. Uh, and uh, if I get a chance to plug, please come and help and volunteer with Rimao when you have time. Okay, so that's it for me, and enjoy the film. My name is Mark Ryan Dharmaraj. I joined WWF Malaysia in 2004 because I believe in the mission to save our biodiversity, especially our tigers. The tiger is the most majestic animal in our forest. It is the king of the jungle. They are apex predators. They regulate their prey like the samba deer, which in turn controls the vegetation. Their connection to the food web is essential. And when tigers thrive, so do our forests. We need tigers more than we think we do. Globally, tiger numbers have plummeted. There are fewer than 4,000 tigers in the wild, occupying less than 7% of their historical range. An international pledge was made at St. Petersburg in 2010 at the Global Tiger Summit to double the number of tigers. Malaysia was then a signatory. Two years prior, Malaysia had already pledged to double tiger numbers when we launched the National Tiger Conservation Action Plan. With 80 actions, the aim was to go from 500 to 1,000 tigers in our jungles by 2020. But unfortunately, instead of doubling tiger numbers, Malaysia has halved the numbers with only 250 left in the wild. The Malayan tiger is now critically endangered under IUCN's red list. And that basically paints a bleak scenario for our Malayan tigers. But other countries around the world have been successful in protecting their tigers. In India and Nepal, tiger numbers are increasing. These countries have bigger problems than Malaysia. Their forests are more fragmented, the human population is bigger, and they have major poverty issues. But it is their leaders and their governments that have the will to protect tigers as part of their ecosystem. They ensure there are enough rangers and patrollers keeping out the poachers. Currently, the main threat for tigers is basically poaching. 
All around the world, tigers are in high demand for traditional Chinese medicine. Their skin, their teeth, their penis, even their whiskers are used as acupuncture needles. Their black market value is higher than any other species. Malaysia's jungles are now inundated with poachers, not only from local villages, but mainly from outside the country, from Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. We are allowing foreigners to come to our country to plunder our national heritage. Thousands of snares are being set in our forests, and it's just a matter of time before they wipe out our tigers and other species too. The Tiger Conservation Action Plan, it has not been implemented holistically. Resources have not been efficiently mobilised and sufficient funding has not been allocated for the action plan. If there are no people or no money, we cannot achieve our main goal of doubling tiger numbers, let alone saving them. WWF Malaysia committedly supports the government in their efforts to save tigers in the Belum Temago Forest Complex. And we have our own tiger conservation program with several threat reduction elements. We have an anti-poaching patrol team to help the authorities to reduce poaching problems. We currently only have three teams, but we hope to increase this number in the near future. We have a monitoring team that is helping to unravel how many tigers there are in the area. We also have people working on the ground, engaging the local communities, basically to get the orang aslis to be the eyes and the ears for the authorities to reduce poaching. In addition, we also monitor the land use in and around the area, as well as try to advocate for better management practices within protected areas and sustainable timber production for us. WWF also organizes high-level conferences and dialogues to garner support from all stakeholders that have a role to play to save tigers. In 2017, the Royal Bloom Declaration was established in the presence of His Royal Highness Prince Charles, the Prince of Wales, President of WWF UK, and His Royal Highness Sultan Nazrin Shah, the patron of WWF Malaysia, to save tigers by increasing patrols in Bloom and to achieve zero poaching in the state by 2020. Royal Bloom State Park is also committed to save tigers by registering for conservation assured tiger standards, or better known as CATS. This is essentially a set of minimum standards to guide effective management of an area for tiger conservation. Royal Bloom State Park is the first site not only in Malaysia, but also Southeast Asia, that has registered. Our tigers are a shared resource. Never has the plight to save them been so urgent. It's now or never. Tiger conservation needs to be a national priority and all parties need to play a role. The federal government, state governments, the Department of Wildlife and National Parks, Forestry Department and even the police and the army, just to name a few. Without everyone on board together, and if we don't step up, we will lose our tigers. Do we want to be known by our children and our grandchildren to be the generation that lost the Malayan tiger under our watch? My name is Christopher Wong. I've been with uh, WWF Malaysia for almost 10 years now. So since I was 
much younger, I love the wall and I love animals. Nain tiger is one of the smallest subspecies of tiger, which can only be found in uh, Malay Peninsula. It is uh, solitary and territorial, except only when it's um, mating and when it's bearing offsprings. Belum Temenggo landscape is known to be one of the highest density of tigers in the country. So it's thought to be about 130 million years old, one of the oldest landscape um, in the world. A surveying Belum Temenggo forest complex is WWF Malaysia's current project. The purpose of this survey is to re-establish the tiger population in both areas which were studied back in 2009 to 2011. And the data that we obtained will be contributed towards the first National Tiger Survey of Peninsula Malaysia. Because of the dense vegetation in our rainforest, which the visibility is just so low, it's so difficult to see a tiger. Over 10 years that I've worked in the forest, I've never seen a tiger. We use camera trap technology to help us in our work, to photograph the tigers, to study them. My team consists of six people, and we averagely spent around um, one to two weeks in the forest, traveling as far as a few tens of kilometers every single trip. Some of the challenges we need to go through in the field are like crossing deep rivers, climbing up steep mountains, and also we still have to um, deal with the mosquitoes and the leeches in the forest that constantly draw our blood. To increase the chances of possibility of capturing tigers in the forest, location needs to be uh, chosen with care. So signs like perk marks are used to guide us in setting up the camera traps. Camera trap is a device where it, it is built with a motion and heat sensor. So when an animal like a tiger passes by in front of the camera trap in the detection zone, it will self-activate to capture a photo of the animal. In every single location, two camera traps will be set up on each side of the trail to photograph both flanks of the tigers. Over the years surveying Belum Temenggo Forest Complex, we collected more than 40,000 photographs of wild animals. They include large mammals like elephants, sun bear, Malayan tapir, and there are also animals which are smaller in sizes, but equally interesting. Out of the 40,000 photographs of wild animals, it's only about 3 to 4% of them are of the tigers. Once in the office, this is when the work on identifying the tiger starts. So the photographs are used to differentiate the tigers from their stripes. Just like our fingerprints, every stripes of the tigers are different. So this is how we can tell if we have captured the same animal at two different times. Back in the 1950s, we had 3,000 wild tigers. And then it comes down to 500 in early 2000. In 2014, it was estimated to be around 250 to 340. Because of the numbers, Malayan tigers are classified as critically endangered. Currently, the National Tiger Survey is ongoing, which will give a better estimation of the status of tigers in the country. But if the trend still persists, we might not even see a wild tiger anymore. We can't give up hope just yet. Cubs are still being photographed. There are still um, a lot of females in the forest as well. So they can still repopulate and increase the number of tigers in the forest.
there's still a lot of things that can be done, but it has to be now. My name is Sharif Mohammed, and I've been working with WF Malaysia since 2006. I started off as a field biologist, but I currently lead the anti-poaching unit in WF Malaysia. Two biggest threats to tigers at the moment are habitat loss and poaching. Poaching is the most immediate threat to tigers and it is actually one of the largest illegal trades after firearms and drugs. WF Malaysia has three patrol teams on the ground. The main objective of our anti-poaching unit is to act as the eyes and ears for the enforcement agencies to take action. Finding poachers is pretty much like looking for a needle in a haystack. Although we do get better at it after becoming more familiar with the landscape and knowing more about the poaching routes and hotspots. Within Bulam Tamungo, there's just one highway which cuts across it. A lot of the access points used by poachers are actually along this highway. We've discovered about 100 access points used by these poachers. It's a combination of trails which they've established over the years, as well as old logging roads. So these access points are used by poachers to venture into the deeper parts of the jungle. The modus operandi of many poachers is to set a series of snares in one place and move from one place to another. So a snare is basically a long piece of cable or rope with the trigger mechanism. So one end of this is tied onto a tree and the other one is made into a loop and set along an animal path. So basically whichever animal that steps on it to trigger the mechanism, it will get caught in the snare. Some years ago, our anti-poaching team actually came across a snared tiger. So this was immediately reported to the enforcement agencies, which is the Department of Wildlife and National Parks, who rushed down to the scene to try and save the tiger. So I witnessed the whole operation from the time they tranquilized the tiger to bring it out on a stretcher, and also treating the tiger on the spot for a snare wound. It was probably snared only for a day or two. However, by that time, the struggle caused the wound to be quite deep already. The more the animal struggles, the tighter the noose will become. So you can imagine the pain the tiger was in here. Yeah? Unfortunately, the tiger died a couple of weeks later in captivity. The trend is alarming. From 2016 to 2017 alone, our team has found close to 250 snares across the huge Balom Tumungo landscape. Because snares are easy and cheap to set up, these snares are actually widely used by foreign poachers, especially from countries such as Vietnam, Cambodia, and Thailand. When our team comes across a snare, they will deactivate it and remove it. Over the long run, these snares can actually empty the forest of large mammals. The anti-poaching unit is also on the lookout for other signs of poachers.
If our team detects a campsite from afar, then we will attempt to stealthily get closer in order to establish if there are people in the campsite. If we confirm that no one is at the campsite, we will slowly approach and inspect the site. Through this, we can tell how many people are camping there, what sort of illegal activities they are doing, and sometimes even establish what nationality these people are. If the campsite is still active, we will mark the position on our GPS and immediately call the enforcement agencies so that they can come and take action. Unfortunately, over the past four years, dozens of foreign poacher camps have been found in Balum Tamango. Royal Balum State Park comes under the jurisdiction of Perak State Parks Corporation and Tamungo Forest Reserve is under the Perak State Forestry Department. The main issue here is staffing. There are not enough law enforcement personnel and rangers to patrol the forest. In Royal Balum State Park, there are only three teams patrolling the area, which is probably only 10% of what we really need. The tiger is the most majestic animal in the jungle, and in a way, it's like the guardian of the forest. Poaching is the most immediate threat towards the survival of wild tigers. Regular, dedicated and systematic patrols are needed to curb poaching. This presence in our jungle is needed now to save the Malayan tiger from extinction. Umi Azurah binti Abdul Rahman. I am a senior community engagement and education officer for WWF Malaysia's Tiger Conservation Program. From a young age, I have been interested in people, to know more about people, to engage with people. I'm really a people's person. I love helping people. I am currently working with local indigenous people or orang asli in Belum Temenggul Forest Complex. This area has been identified as one of Malaysia's tiger priority landscapes. We have been working with the local orang asli community in Belum Temenggul since 2009. We run programs to increase awareness and encourage support of tiger conservation in 19 villages in the area. The orang asli are very knowledgeable about the environment. Their way of life depends on the forest. This knowledge is passed down from generation to generation. They respect the forest, the rivers, and the wildlife. The orang asli have great respect for tigers. They believe they can live in harmony and coexist with tigers and with nature. WWF Malaysia cannot work alone. It is important to collaborate with the local and orang asli communities to create a balance between people and nature. We need this local support for our efforts to be really effective in tiger conservation. Kampong Semelo is very unique. They were the first to take the initiative to form their own community-based monitoring group. They are quite concerned about poaching and encroachment in the area. 
they want to play a more active role, take initiatives and take actions on their own. Recently, they found an abandoned camp and they also discovered a bullet case. Evidence of poachers. We shared this useful data with the rest of the Tiger team at WWF and the authorities. We work with them, helping with capacity building, showing them new skills such as how to use a GPS, read maps and basic first aid. We have monthly meetings with them where they share with us their findings. We also guide them to be more organised in data collection and management and we see improvements all the time. The community's presence in the forest act as a deterrence for illegal activities. Outsiders, poachers, will think twice before they enter the area. The orang asli can be the first line of defence for tigers and wildlife. The villages of Kampung Semelo can also use ecotourism as a means of getting an income. With their great knowledge of the forest, they have excellent skills as nature guides. Selling traditional handicraft can also help support their village. WWF assists in connecting them to potential buyers when possible. Community engagement is interesting. You meet all kinds of people, different personalities, different characteristics. I hope to see the Malayan tiger still in existence in our forest for a very, very long time. I would also like to see that the communities living within the tiger landscape can improve their livelihood while coexisting with nature. WWF is already working with the local stakeholders that are committed to saving tigers, but it is important to get more communities involved to protect Malaysia's most iconic animal. Saya Lukman Hakim bin Hamzah, wakil belia dalam menyelamatkan harimau Malaya. Bagi saya, harimau ialah tanda keyakinan dan kekuatan. Kita tahu harimau itu sendiri ialah Raja Rimba dan saya mendapatkan inspirasi keyakinan diri saya daripada harimau ini. Harimau Malaya simbol negara kita, menunjukkan kita berani untuk pertahankan kedaulatan negara kita. Bagi saya, harimau harimau Malaya sekarang diancam kepupusan. Daripada 3,000, macam mana boleh jadi 300 saja? Pemburuan haram adalah punca yang utama. Dan lebih teruk lagi, harimau Malaya tidak mampu untuk melawan kerana kelicikan pemburu haram memasang perangkap yang menjerat mereka. Kepupusnya harimau Malaya menunjukkan kemusnahan identiti dan maruah negara kita. Pendidikan awal terhadap konservasi harimau sangat penting. Tiga kata kunci saya berikan untuk memudahkan kita para belia untuk mengetahui peranan kita. Yang pertama, sebar. Sebar kita boleh menyebarkan maklumat dan isu semasa mengenai harimau Malaya menerusi media sosial kita. Yang kedua ialah sertai. Belia patut sertai mana-mana aktiviti dan juga program yang dianjurkan oleh mana-mana organisasi yang terlibat dalam pemuliharaan harimau. Kenapa? Dalam mereka menyaksanakan program ini, mereka dapat penghayatan terhadap peri pentingnya selamatkan harimau Malaya. Yang ketiga ialah suara. 
suara adalah satu usaha para belia untuk menyatakan pandangan mereka dan memberi cadangan kepada kerajaan. Kerana apa? Apabila kerajaan menyokong usaha memulihara imam ini, jadi semua usaha ini berjalan lancar dan lebih mudah. Sekarang, keadaan harimau Malaya sangat-sangat memimbangkan. Harapan saya untuk harimau Malaya pada masa akan datang. Yang pertama, saya nak pastikan supaya tak ada pun aktiviti pemburuan haram yang dilakukan tanpa mendapat tindakan undang-undang. Yang kedua, saya nak pastikan semua rakyat Malaysia tahu dan sedar betapa pentingnya untuk kita selamatkan harimau Malaya. Dan yang ketiga, saya berharap supaya usaha untuk kita gandakan bilangan harimau Malaya di Malaysia dapat dicapai pada masa akan datang. Kalau kita semua, belia, orang dewasa, tak kenal usia, tak kenal taraf sosial, kita bekerjasama dan berganding bahu, saya yakin usaha ini dapat dilaksanakan. Saya menyeru semua belia untuk sertai saya dalam usaha kita selamatkan harimau Malaya. Kita tahu peranan kita dan laksanakannya. Mari kita kembalikan ngauman harimau yang lemah kepada ngauman harimau yang berani dan semangat. Daripada roar kepada roar! Thank you so much, Miss Lara, for that amazing, amazing documentary. And I, I don't know about you guys, but I hope you had a really great time because I definitely did. If you guys want, you know, do comment in the section in the chat box next to us. You know, on how do you feel about it, and maybe which one is your favorite series? Because clearly, mine is the one on the youth. Um, we can also definitely see that the documentary touches a lot about how, you know, a single a single Malayan tiger relates to all stakeholders, whether it be the government, different countries, um, the orang asli communities, and also the youth. So yeah, share with us what are your thoughts. Now let's move on to the next session, which is um, the panel session. Um, we have a, a we have a, a great selection of speakers today, and we're going to be talking about the truth behind women in wildlife conservation. Um, personally for me, Jane Goodall has been a personal hero of mine. And I've always thought that, you know, how cool would it be to be able to like help the animals in the jungle? And yeah, and it's so amazing to see Malaysians doing that in person. Uh, very, very excited to introduce you. And maybe I can invite some uh, the speakers to introduce yourself and also share with us a fun fact about yourself that not many people would know about you. So maybe let's start with Anis from Rimau because we were just talking about your organization. Anis, are you there? All right, maybe a technical difficulty, but maybe we can go with Bam. Yeah. Oh, was that Anis? Yeah. Oh, hi Anis, yes. Hi. Hi. Okay. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the film. All right. Um, my name is Anis. I'm from Rimau. Previously, I was working with uh, Novista Media, the company that Lara is from. But I'm still working with Lara under uh, Rimau, which is an NGO for tiger conservation. So yeah, I'll be one of the speakers today. And fun one fun fact about me is. Besides all the conservation uh, works that I'm doing, I also do theater. So, yeah. <laughs> it's life a big stage, and we're yes, also excited. Life is a big stage. Awesome. Yeah, Thank you so much for sharing. And I'm not going to let you off the hook. We're definitely mm -hmm. going to come back to you and ask okay. you a little bit about your work in uh, with the documentary. Okay. Next. Let's go with Bam. Uh, can you introduce yourself and share a fun fact? Hello, ladies. My name is Bam, or my real name is Mariani Ramli, actually. 
I am the president and the founder for Gibbon Conservation Society, and I'm also the uh, project director for Gibbon Rehabilitation Project. Um, a, fact, a fact about me is I'm an introvert, and I spend most of my time with the animals. If not with the gibbons, I, I will spend my time with the dogs, and I spend less time with humans. I mean, and I'm always nervous with humans. And I think the fun fact that I should share is about gibbons because since we talk about Rimau, Harimau, why don't I share a bit about gibbons? Why I why we have this this society? So gibbons, just to let you guys, you all know, is the king of vacation. There are no other mammal species except bats that fast pass in the jungle. So they are the the fastest primates, you know, the mammals in the jungle, and then they are the only singing apes in the world. And we have five species in Malaysia. And now gibbons are already listed as endangered species in the IUCN red list. And they are a totally protected species. And one of their main threats here in uh, Malaysia is um, the poaching for illegal wildlife trade. So that's the fact about given. Thank you so much. Uh, and that's a really great fact. Thank you so much for sharing. I'm so excited to learn more about gibbons uh, and also about your work later. And last but not least, uh, let's bring it all the way to Kudat and welcome Eva. Yes, hi, I'm Alina and everyone. So um, I'm Eva Vivian Justin from Kudat Turtle Conservation Society or short for KPCS. Um, so we are actually um, from a small community-based organization in Kudat. If you guys know of Kudat, Kudat is actually a uh, more famous as the tip of Borneo in Sabah, Malaysia. So that's where we are located at, at the tip, the very tip of Borneo. Um, and I, uh, what else? Uh, fun fact about me, um, I would say uh, besides uh, wildlife conservation, I am also passionate about um, education. I believe um, ed everyone should have access to education. So yeah, I guess that's <laughs> the fun fact, uh, fun fact about me. Thank you so much. We have our own Malaysian Malala in the house. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing, ladies. So let's get into the, the questions where I'll be asking you all the tough questions. And for the audience, if you guys have any interesting questions or anything that uh, sparks your curiosity, feel free to ask these ladies your questions in the chat box. We're more than happy to hear your thoughts. Right, so now I'm going to start with Anis because we just uh, finished watching the documentary. Can you tell us about your experience working on um, on Novista and also Rimau? And you know, if there are any um, small uh, small parts of the documentary that people might have missed, or yeah, anything that you would like to share with us on the documentary? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, so for the documentary, as uh, Lara mentioned earlier, it was made in 2018. So um, 2018 is quite a crucial year because we just got the number of the tiger from the National Tiger Survey and it didn't look good. In Belum Tomongo itself, there is a 60% drop. But at the same time, there was like um, the main threats for tigers is poaching. As uh, some of you might know, uh, poachers come in and out from uh, our our forest to uh, snare these animals. But then there were not enough people protecting the the tiger at the time. There were no not enough people on the ground. But like um, as Lara also mentioned earlier, with this film, we managed to approach quite a few of the decision maker, the minister, minister at the time, uh, Dr. Xavier, uh, watched it and was touched by the film and uh, decided to go all out with tiger operation, with tiger uh, saving operation. So uh, since then we see a lot more effort being put into, for example, like OBK that was launched in 2019. OBK is Operasi Versapatu Kazana, which is a collaboration between uh, Perhilitan and also um, the police. So, um, and there was also like, oh yeah, in 2018, Rima wasn't established yet. And then after that, we, uh, yeah, we, we, we created Rima. And then there was also Menrak, which is another, um, patrolling in your unit that is based in Belum. So there were 
a lot more action that can be seen. So, and, and it is something that is, uh, I'm not saying that the movie, uh, the, the film actually made all this, but things like this, these little, little things that are letting people being aware of the situation do make changes. So, uh, yeah, I, I guess that's my point. Um, so uh, we shot this film and then we got a lot more questions coming back and we answer and then a lot more things being done. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. Thank you so much. And it, it really helps with your passion for uh, performing arts, right? And <laughs> it's also great because like, you know, with the documentary, you're actually able to see people in action and yeah. it's also easier for you to advocate um, when people can actually see what's going on and mm. like you said, uh, going to the minister and showing him, yeah, yeah it's <laughs> I guess another thing that the film also highlights is the many elements of uh, conservation. Like it's not just research, it's not just being on the ground, it's also uh, community engagement, it's also awareness, creating awareness, advocating of the issue is uh, getting involved, uh, get, creating a relationship with the local people so that they, we have their support. So, so we uh, said that we're all in this together. And of course, to have um, the, 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 the what it, cooperation from the authorities, the policy makers, the decision makers. So these are all important to get every stakeholders together in making it happen, then only you can, when everyone is on the same page, work is so much easier. Yeah, and collaboration is such a key element in Correct. the conversation. Yeah. Thank you so much, Anis. And, um, you know, since we're talking about uh, International Women's Day, let's, <laughs> you know, really get down into, like, the role of women and also uh, women's experience in basically, like, saving the earth. Um, let's, uh, let's take in a little uh, a few statistics here. Um, according uh, uh, under uh, the gender equality review, um, it says that sixty seven percent of climate related decision making roles are occupied by men. So we're saying that almost seventy percent of like decision making roles are, you know, held by men. However women and children are the ones are the, um, are the groups of people who would be at most adversely impacted by decision making around natural resources and ecosystems, which is unfortunate. So maybe if I may um, direct this question to Eva, um, as women who are on the front lines of conservation work, because you do a lot of um, capacity building and you also do a lot of conservation work, could you share with us a little bit about how, I mean, the role of women uh, in advocating, supporting uh, your conservation and sustainability initiatives? And maybe you can also relate on how, uh, how, that, how does that, if there's any changes during COVID? Yes. Yeah, um, so, um, of course, it, since the pandemic happened, uh, it definitely has been hard for most of us, I would say. And as, um, we have been uh, during this pandemic and also this uh, restricted movement order. We have been spending too much time, uh, there are more time at home, including the children. And it is um, also known that a uh, woman actually have uh, uh, very naturally have this um, nurturing nature. And also because since the pandemic happened, um, women have been spending more time with. Uh, especially younger members of the family at home. And um, we, I would say um, because of this pandemic as well, um, this is actually an opportunity um, because younger family members tend to always tag along with women, with the women within everything that they do. And because of this, I see this as an opportunity for the women to be the role model of for these um, youngsters and in, in educating and also in um, raising environmental awareness among this, uh, this uh, younger uh, generation. So, and in terms of conservation, I think it is, this is the time that is um, very important for us um, 
empowering the women with uh, knowledge needed that can um, uh, so that these women can um, help advocating for the environment as well and hopefully empowered another member of the family's closest family um, to do the same. So yeah, I yeah I guess that's that and yeah conservation as well. Um, yeah, I will I will say in our uh, society in our organization, the women have played quite a very big role in our conservation in terms of um, education and awareness activities to the public as well. And yeah, I guess uh, we are um, equal, I would say equal with our uh, male counterpart. And for that, yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, that's that in terms of um, sustainability initiatives, yes, women have been uh, very helpful in, in that sense. Yeah, I'm so glad to hear that that's quite progressive. And um, yeah, I really love your point about, and I love your optimism about how you see COVID, the COVID pandemic as an opportunity, um, you know, to also teach the younger generation. And, you know, I, I'm not too sure, but I do hear that, you know, because of the pandemic, people don't really travel, you don't really disrupt the ecosystem. So people, I mean, you know, you can definitely see that um, a lot of the wildlife population becomes a bit more thriving during this pandemic. Um, yeah, so I'm going to go to Bam and actually ask her my next question. Um, we, I mean, you know, based on the statistics mentioned earlier about how 67% of uh, decision-making roles are occupied by men on climate-related issues, uh, we can definitely see that women are underrepresented in higher leadership positions in conservation science. I'm not sure if you agree, but um, are there... I mean, what causes this? What are the issues, underlying issues, uh, to cause this inequality in decision making process? Uh, Little. Um, for this question, I would like to share based on my own experience. I realized in Malaysia before two thousand thirteen, the stereotype in uh, of women being under. The A wildlife ranger. I started working in 2007. I need to to struggle to be heard by my clique. You know, that time I work in conservation division, so we need to go to the wildlife to do wildlife inventory in the jungle. I only spend like less than 10 days a month at home, and normally we go in a group like seven or nine of us. So the ratio will be like one or two women, and the rest is men. So normally we will spend around five to 15 days in the jungle. No coverage. We need to cross states and district by trekking the jungle, etc. So each trip, men always lead the way doing the rentis, you know, buka jalan, holding the GPS, the peta topo, and women just follow the belakang. So every day around 5 to 6 p.m., it's already dark in the jungle, and we need to stop and camp. What happened was, women always being asked to prepare the meal and do the washing of pots and pans in the jungle, okay? We just as tired. We also brought the same big haversack on our back, went to the mountains, hills, river together. But uh, men, when they arrive, they can directly rest and continue the work, yet they say that time women are weaker. Okay, and in I'm in the Satuan Sekerja as a assistant secretary. All ex exco from 11 states that time are men, and I'm the only woman that time. So any issue regarding uh, women stuff, I will brought in the meeting. So I remember during 2010 to 2012, if I'm not mistaken, um, the department planned to stop taking women as staff due to uh, due to assume incapabilities to do work, especially kerja masuk hutan lah. So I need to convince the department about why they can't stop women in tech. So the department agreed and they de decreased the percentage of uh, women in tech instead. Here, to be honest, I don't put uh, all the blame in the department and to my colleague, colleagues. And th this is like uh, objective, I mean, objective pandangan, perspective that came after a few cases involved women. And there's also cases involved men too, you know, at the time. But in this field, between women and men, women will be easily disqualified due to the stereotype that women are weak. This is by, based on my own experience. And then it's just because uh, cases like a uh, woman cried and gave up during the jungle trip, but there are men that cried and gave up too. 
and then even pretend pengsan some more you know in the jungle so they can be rescued by helicopter and do not need don't don't need to continue the trekking so actually things happen about for both women and men kan but and for myself it takes me few trips to prove that i can lead i can i can do the merentis clear the way for my group and then i can lead in the jungle that's why i also been chosen to be in the persatuan sekerja to represent you know the women in the department but for other women colleagues it takes them forever and until now they still have stay, have the same kind of treatment but like i said in this field women is easily judged lah you know so i and i realized after 2013 thanks to the social media the awareness and education about women rights are easily spread facebook instagram you know and women started to know their rights getting spirit from other women struggle and men also started realize the needs to respect women so now we can see that if there's men that still having the stereotype against women they will be known as lelaki ketinggalan zaman you know and being in asia believe me there's still cases like this but we as a woman we need to stand up and need to prove to them and stop underestimate us yeah, that's amazing thank you so much i love so many of your points and i think it's really important for us to acknowledge that um, there's a lot of self reflection for us to do uh, even among, i mean among men and also among within women because i think sometimes we subconsciously maybe like prejudge other women also um and that's quite dangerous because we need to uh, support um each other and i think it's also important to stress on the role of um men as allies because women empowerment could not have happened without the help of male allies so it makes a lot of difference uh if some of the male allies can help to speak up uh, on behalf of the women who are silenced and i'm so glad um Don, that you uh rep, you are representative uh, representative of the female voices in um in in your organization so thank you so much for all that you do um all right so let's talk i mean i'm going to direct the next question to anis because we did talk a little bit about policy making um you know and how how policy making actually affects wildlife conservation um you mentioned a little bit about merak and maybe you can talk uh, i mean maybe you can share a little bit about what would you recommend for uh, for better policy making in conservation uh, in, in wildlife conservation um yes sure so uh with menrock okay uh, a little background on menrock so uh, menrock petrol unit is a collaboration between rimau and perak state parks corporation which is the, the guardian of uh, royal belum so uh, all of menrock is made up of jahai jahai is uh, uh, an orang asli tribe the or the local community in royal belum they just stay in the community we we at rimau think that it is important for menrock to be uh, from jahai because it is their their area their home so it only fair for them to protect it but um the thing about this jahai people they are very remote so a lot of time they don't have access to education and they don't have the qualification they don't go to school so they they cannot read they cannot write and lagi lah they don't of course they don't have spm or bmr but because of this they cannot be employed by the government so we wanted them like our idea is for us to train them around and let on get them absorbed by the government so that they can have a more secure livelihood while also protecting the wildlife and their habitat but our current policy doesn't allow this the minimum they need to have is pmr so i think this is something that we should policy makers should review like when uh, people are so remote to be to access education you cannot um, deny them employment because of the things that they themselves in the first place are not um, they don't have opportunity to 
So yeah. this is something that's definitely uh, something that can be high, that must be highlighted because it's just unfair. It's just totally unfair. They are as Malaysian as is, they uh, deserve this. And yeah, something that definitely worth mentioning. Yep. Thank you so much, Anis. And I definitely agree because sometimes I feel like policy makers uh, are very disconnected from mm. the problems. The reality um, of it. Yes, and sometimes they they just follow outdated laws and regulations mm. because it's just a status quo and so comfortable to just follow the status quo instead of like you know yeah. having the inconvenience of changing um yeah. things. Yeah, so yeah. thank you so much for that. No and problem. Yeah, I think like, you know, uh, I, I, I think uh, you, you ladies really uh, empower the grassroots level to help uh, empower and also to raise your voice to the policymakers. So kudos to all you, um, to all you ladies um, who are the speakers today. So let's talk a little bit about the role of the youth because, I mean, as we know here, a lot of the audience are um, among the young people who are relatively shy. I can see that the chat box is not, um, you know, you guys can definitely say hi. We're not going to bite. I, I, I don't think the speakers here bite. Maybe they're, the animals that they're conserving <laughs> are might. Um, a bit bitey, but, yeah. Yeah, they might be a bit bitey, um, but the speakers will not bite you. So feel free to, like, you know, keep on asking the questions. We're more than happy to hear them. Um, so let's talk about the role of the youth. Um, Maybe uh, this this question goes to anyone out there. From your experience, in what ways have you noticed that the youth have been involved in conservation campaigns and maybe like bringing great impact into your initiatives? Anyone wants to take that? Um, I can I can share. Yes, from, yeah, from our. Uh, Society, I can say around 90% involvement in our society is from youth, 70 to 80% women. And at the Gibbon Rehabilitation Project Center, uh, we have two women youth who work really hard every day doing manual labor, uh, labor to take care of the Gibbons, and a senior woman as well who does backbreaking work every day. And age is just a number, you know. For a while, it's, it's, it was just uh, three women at Grab. Like um, doing everything, me, our project manager, Farhana, and then Afiza. So from cage building to surrogate mothers for the infants. And now we have two more staff, like and another woman, Shikin, and many interns. So in the society, the majority of our volunteers are youth as well. They do fundraising, uh, communication, events, etc. Uh, many youths join our grab internship program and many youth share our awareness content and social media, which is really good because it helps educate uh, more people out there. Thank you so much. And anyone else who would like to share um, any inspiring stories uh, from the youth who have helped them uh, bring positive impact? I may add. <laughs> yes, sure. um, this might be a bit like uh, bragging a bit <laughs> i'm not sure but I, I would say um i myself is actually quite a success story from kuda total conservation society because um actually i started as an intern with kpcs actually since um 2017 and after doing a period of internship with them it actually that's when i actually started uh you know wanted to really be involved in conservation even though um Actually, uh, before this, I was taking uh, my degree uh, in marine science, even though in it was in a science, uh, environmental science. But um, if I'm being honest, I at that time I would say I'm still a bit ignorant on um, conservation. But somehow during it is during my internship with KTCS that somehow um, really opened up my eyes to. Um, toward this um, effort into uh, conservation, not just specifically on sea turtles, but also the ecosystem and basically the whole of the environment itself. So yeah, in a way, I'm um, very thankful also to be able to um, get involved in um, this organization because um, that's uh, where I started and 
where I am now. So yeah, in a way, I think KTCS, um, the organization itself is actually a very um, good starting point for me. Yeah, for me, yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, I don't think that's bragging at all. In fact, you are definitely a success story and you should really own that story. Um, yeah, and personal stories are always my favorite. So thank you so much for sharing your personal story with us. Um, Anish, do you want to add anything a little, uh, you know, a little bit about how the youth have uh, given any positive impact in your initiatives? Yeah, definitely. Um, for us, Remote is a very small NGO. We just started in 2018. We haven't, we just turned two years old, like last September, we barely do. And uh, because of that, a lot of our work became what it is because of volunteers. And a lot of these volunteers are from the youth and women. Like, um, I can show you if I can share some. It's hold on. Let me see. sorry. Let me just play a little. Oh, sorry. Let's say. Can you see it? Not yet. Okay. Uh. Hold on. Okay. So, as you can see here, back in two thousand eighteen. Uh, we actually pa painted murals in Greek as part of global tiger, our Global Tiger Day celebration. And um, in making this happen, uh, people from schools and universities came together and get this painted. And uh, we like together, we also organized activities for the children in Greek for them uh, to celebrate the Global Tiger Day. And uh, for this, this is like our celebration in Royal Bloom. And uh, we got, uh, we, we basically got like uh, 20 people of volunteers like around that to come and celebrate with us. And all of them uh, set up all these like wayang pacha for the children. Uh, we have face painters coming all the way to KL with like five hours journey to Greek to paint these faces so little things like this um, was mean a lot to us actually yeah you, you can see that like there's a wayang pacha and face painters and um yeah and we also have like the uh, you know for us youth can just um contribute in the ways that they can in many any ways that they can for example we have this uh girl she's a BTS fan. Ooh. So uh, for one of their birthdays, one of the members' birthdays, I'm not too familiar with BTS, so please don't, <laughs> if any of you are. It's okay. Sorry, Jen, <laughs> I also don't know. <laughs> I don't know much, but like, apparently it's one of their, uh, what is it, Cult not culture, like one of their practice is to raise money for, um, the person's birthday in the name so in the name of that celebrity they donate the money so this uh bts fan girl she's i don't know she's probably 15 14 i'm not sure she's you very young and she uh, sells stickers and little merchandise of bts and then she got like 500 ringgit from that sale and then she donated to Rimau in the name of uh, that celebrity but still is 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 it means so much to us like doing like the little thing that you can do um yeah yeah uh, that, that's how like uh doing something with you like and for a good cause in the name of something that you like so i think you, yeah if you let's say you can bake cupcakes you can sell cupcakes and then uh, some money of it you can donate not necessarily to Rima, you can donate to Given or you, you, go, can, go, you can donate to the Turtles and whatnot, any organization that you like. So yeah, I think you can do that, like something that you're good at and then yeah, proceed after Thank you. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that story as well. Okay, no problem. So, I have final two, uh, two final questions before we go over the, to the Q&A. Um, the first question is, 
how do you think we the um or like the youth in uh, in particular can help uh, you in your conservation initiatives or in your conservation work um maybe we can start with Bob. Ada dengar bunyi matkul ya? Oh, sorry. Tak, tak dengar. Tak ada, okay. Okay, okay you got, um, so you are there who want to involve, you can find us at Gibbon Conservation Society in our social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. And then you, from there, you can get to know about us in details. And if you think you want to help conserve this, the singing apes of Malaysia, you can PM us. To be honest now, we really need a fund, uh, really need fundraisers. And but if you but you can also help us in other division as like event events communication program coordinating and media team and there's few more teams, and if you have free time this uh, April and May come and join us at DREP internship program, which is it's a four four week program where you can learn about gibbon husbandry behavioral data collection. Uh, leadership skills, enrichment, and we also teach uh, the jungle survival skills. And then sometimes we do uh, cooking, we rotate cooking for for this, uh, the interns. Uh. So because I have like not much experience, like more than 10 years experience as a wildlife ranger, I want to share this knowledge to our of our forest with our younger generation. It's a unique skill in this technology focused time. So not necessarily you need to have a science or biology background you just need to have patience and will to learn and then you can get all the info the cut link three lah you know link three just find given conservation society thank you so much Pam. and it's so funny how you know back then during my days you know when we say volunteer it's always like scooping animal poop um uh -huh. but yeah I, i'm so glad to see how volunteering has also evolved nowadays so yeah mm -hmm. it's much uh, more glamorous than uh, cleaning up food so i recommend that people do consider volunteering for um, for your initiative and what about eva what do you uh, how can the youth help you um yeah um for me um i personally think that uh, conservation is not just limited to hands-on activity on the field um especially during uh, times like this it's very hard to do things on the field and so um, I would um, recommend or suggest everyone, uh, youth nowadays, they are very tech savvy. So uh, these skills are something that they really should um, use, utilize. Um, they should use like the social media platform to help raise awareness on, um, on conservation, not just wildlife, environment, anything. And they should just like what we are doing right now, uh, the dialogue session, um, you should really participate in this kind of activities because uh, this is where they can get all the information if they are really um, uh, want to join um, any conservation uh, efforts. And yeah, and they should also be the the one, the um, I'll say, um, to create like a platform also to so that to encourage more people to talk about it, to talk about conservation because Awareness is not just a one-time thing. It needs to be constantly, uh, you know, carry uh, carry out so that everyone know because there is a difference between um, being aware, like you know, there is issues on the environment right now, but there's also a difference whether you are you only know about it, but did you do something about it? So yeah, yeah I think it's also something that's very important. So yeah, I think that that's what the youth can do uh, nowadays. Awesome. And last but not least, Anis, over to you. I think you're muted, girl. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, with Rima, we always welcome volunteers. Previously, like uh, I said, you can contribute in any ways that you you think of or better yet you can just come to us and tell us what you're comfortable uh, with what you're good at and then uh, let's it's, it's always good to have discussions and then from that discussions we can know how you can help because as an NGO without with without many with really very limited resources 
we always welcome any type of help. So sometimes we didn't think of something, but when we have the thought, when we have the conversation, oh, we can make something. It's always like that. It's always good to have constant discussion with all these volunteers. Yes. So yeah, if you like to volunteer, please you can email me. <laughs> or, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it's like show this plugin. Awesome. So uh, I'm going to save my question, my last question uh, at the last part, but let's mm -hmm. go to the Q and A's. Uh, so I see that you guys are less shy now. So, you know, we love the energy. We love all the incoming questions. Feel free to keep on asking. I see a really interesting question by uh, Mahadevi actually. I mean, so I'm not going to go with the questions in order if you guys don't mind, but let's talk about how it all started. Um, how do you start this journey? Maybe each of you can share a little bit about how you started this journey because, um, you know, uh, yeah, because uh, Mahadevi is saying that um, things like this require us to understand that we're not going to have a lot of money uh, and yeah, how do you also maintain um, this work and, you know, how do you like not get burnt out with all this craziness? Um, anyone wants to start first? I guess I. Okay. Uh, so I started as a because my background is in media, so I'm trained to be a filmmaker. But I was trained to be a filmmaker, and then I was working with Novista when we were doing all these films. When I because like, to be honest, before this I knew almost nothing about the situation. Then when I get into this all documentary, then I learn how dire the situation is. And I can call myself like accidental conservationist law, person I'm easily say. But um, and then uh, I started with Mao and now I'm here. Uh, so how do you start is just that if I think like is is always okay to drop an email to anyone. I think people in the conservation uh, field is very friendly and open to, uh, you know, people approach, approaching them. So uh, if you want to start, there's always someone like you can research and uh, the NGO that you're interested in, the cause that you want to, to fight for and just drop an email and you can all start from there. And about the money, yeah, there's very little money in uh, conservation for now because I don't know, <laughs> I cannot comment much about that. <laughs> but like um, the thing about working with NGO is also we always constantly uh, writing grants to pay for our projects and also for ourselves. But it's always like, as we do our conservation work, we're also looking for money to find the conservation work. So this is something that you always have to keep in mind. Lah. You need to find the money to do the work at the same time. Yeah, I suppose. I guess uh, Bam and Eva want to add anything to that. Yeah, and maybe Eva, do you want to... Uh, I mean, you talked a little bit about how you were an intern, but how, how did it all start? Why did you even decide to intern at KDCS? KTCS, sorry. Yeah, honestly, I, if you believe, I may say, um, I will think it's kind of like fate as well. I'm not sure. Um, because back then, during even my study years, we, our lecturer actually once brought our whole class to actually volunteer with KTCS as well at that time when I was still a student. But I don't know, I guess back then I was still young and dumb and broke. <laughs> and so I, I, kind, I, I actually already forgotten the name of the organization that we were actually volunteering with because at that time I think I was just really want to play with my friends and everything. But somehow then um, a few years later, uh, a couple years later, when it was time for us to you know look for internship placement and I actually applied to quite a lot of um, organization as well. But somehow I didn't manage to get into any of it. And that's when my uh, one of my lecturer actually then suggested why not intern with KTCS then. So okay, if it although I thought 
oh this is the first time i heard of this organization even though actually a few years back i already volunteered with them so yeah that's how it started then i started yeah. in again with them and well here i am now yeah who knows that jodoh goes beyond your romantic relationship <laughs> So yeah, and maybe Bam, do you want to share with us how you started? For me, I'm always an animal lover since young, and then that's what brought me to work with the wildlife department. But to fo start focusing on gibbons is when, back on 2013, when I started to have a gibbon pet. Actually, I used to have a pet, which is my mindset that time also. To be honest, even though I work with the with the wildlife department, I don't really understand the real like. Conserva conservation meaning and so I keep elect which is our t-shirt now elect if you can see oh, <laughs> so elect is becoming our like, ambassador for our oh. society <laughs> because while I kept I juggled it as a pet I realized that my home is never big enough for him then from there, I started to learn about gibbons, the existence of gibbons in Malaysia, the species, somewhere. So it doesn't take me long to know that actually gibbons, we don't have a small apes, a, a gibbons rehabilitation center in Malaysia, a single gibbon. So I, I went to Thailand and Cambodia to, to learn about the word rehabilitation and I volunteer there. And then because my intention to, to give Macam bagi kepuasan to Alec. Tak kira lah jadi my pet ke apa ke. So when I learn about this rehabilitation, then I dig a bit more. I learn about conservation. Then from there, I found out that I, I'm not supposed to put him in my house. I suppose I should rehabilitate him so I can send him back to the wild because they're already in danger to add their punya population. But it's a bit too late for me, you know. Um, that time, Alec died because of bacteria infection and I'm in one trauma I don't want to be involved with gibbons anymore even to learn about apa, to talk about gibbons or even other animals Emang, because I, I think I eat together makan sama sama pergi office sama sama kan so um masa tu lah I memang dah involved but then I got get a apa, dapat phone call daripada another gibbon owner asking for my help to take care of his gibbon because dia punya gibbon dah start menggigit tau. Sebelum tu dia main dengan anak dia dan dah start atas umur 8 bulan dia start menggigit. So from there I learn about the the illegal wildlife trade punya trend in Malaysia and I I found out that gibbon is one of the famous species for exotic pet trade. Most of them need to uh, they apa akan di kidnap from their family and then the parents will be killed because they are monogamy, you know. To get the baby, you need to, to kill the parents at least or the whole family. So I don't want, but I don't want this guy to repeat the same mistake that I did. So I receive, I accept the second given and then people start contacting me. I received the third given, the sixth given and all. Very from there lah. Actually, I, I receive um, an offer from from another organization to give me grants to continue my master for a flat-headed cat study, the, the wild cat gun. And then it's between uh, apa nama? funded project and non-funded project, yeah. but I just even, I, I sell everything, I have my car, my house, everything, because wow. of because my love to elect and I don't want other species like dia pun, um, have the same fate lah, like him. So I want to laugh. And then other country actually started given habitation projects since 1990s. Yeah. That's why I see the importance lah. I don't say that other animals are not important, but totally yeah. understand. Yeah. 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 Given yeah. is just a thing. Yeah. And yeah. I think this uh, sort of relates to Hui Min's question about, you know, how do you decide which animal to specialize in? I think it doesn't, I mean, you don't choose the animal, the animal sort of chooses you. Um, I don't know if, you know, if, if you agree, but yeah, feel free to chip in uh, or if, if that's uh, something that we can agree with, I can move on with the next question. If anyone wants to add to that, the animal chooses you part. 
I mean, for me, dealing directly with the animal, we need to handle them semua. I believe the animals chooses us because not all the, macam for the gibbons lah, not all the gibbons allow semua suka-suka orang untuk, untuk handle them, kan? Yeah. So I believe they choose us. I, I have a, a, a bit of a confession. I volunteered for wildlife, a, a wildlife rescue organization and everyone was talking about how nice this gibbon is. And then the moment I entered the cage, she just like literally attacked my face. So, you know, it literally chooses you. She hates me. <laughs> but yeah. Um, so let's go to, uh, there's so many amazing questions here. So thank you so much, uh, everyone. I'm so glad that you guys are less shy now. Um, I'm going to ask uh, this question maybe to Eva. Um, be, uh, this is a question from Fadli. And um, basically, he's asking about how do you balance conservation and also social economic situation in your uh, in your community. So for example, you know we are telling people to stop, uh, you know, digging up the turtle eggs, but that's their source of income. So how do you sort of balance that um, and still provide income, a sustainable income to the villagers? Do you wanna share? Yeah. Um. Actually, um. At least in our case study side, um, the communities that we are working with, they they do admit even our members they do admit before they started this conservation works they actually do consume um uh, turtle eggs sea turtle eggs and everything but they never actually sell it at least the community that i'm working with they they don't sell it for um income but only for own consumption so um ever since they started um actually they are actually the one that first started this uh this um, effort, you know, this conservation works. The community themselves, they actually first started it. And then that's when um, another person, a KPCS come in as um, to advise them in terms of administration and uh, management and everything because community, they only know how to do work on the field. Uh, so the KPCS, the basically the administration team helps in uh, earn, uh, you know, uh, getting more funding, um, advertising um, works and everything. So um, now we are actually, um, our conservation works, actually we um, try to, not just trying to conserve the wildlife, but we are actually trying to look for, uh, use this conservation work as um, a way for the communities to earn income from it. So basically um, how, how it works is that we get volunteers to come. So basically, uh, usually these volunteers will pay for the accommodation, the meals and everything, the community there will provide all this stuff. And at the same time, these volunteers will get to, uh, you know, get to do uh, conservation works together with the members on the field. So that's how it is uh, for us. But um, if I may add another thing is that um, actually um, right now um, in Sabah itself, um, the wildlife department currently is actually um, drafting a prop SOP for uh, wildlife, eh, not wildlife, sorry, uh, sea turtles action plan for Sabah State, just for Sabah State. So, um, one of the proposed SOP in inside the turtle of uh, the SOP is that every every sea turtles, uh, any sea hatchling, basically baby sea turtles, need to be released immediately to the sea. Once it hatched, you need to re release immediately. Um, however, some of our uh, community members actually um, express uh, quite a dissatisfaction on this SOP because uh, this is where they actually earn income from. Basically, uh, our members on the field, they will release the sea turtles one day after they hatch. Uh, so the turtles hatch today, we will release it tomorrow night. Yeah, basically there's one day period uh, where they will keep the turtles in a dark area so that they are not too active and everything. So um, somehow if this SOP were put in place, um, the community members somehow feel that they will lose their income because of this. So um, yeah, it. so this issue actually has quite brought um, attention to us on which one should be prioritized now. Is it the wildlife or is it the people that are protecting the wildlife? Um, for me personally, I of course I uh, believe that 
both of these should go hand in hand because if we don't protect the people that are protecting the wildlife then it's definitely going to be a very hard time for us to then protect the environment as well so i will say in terms of policy uh, i say we definitely need to find a better way on how we can uh, maybe meet somewhere in the middle where both the wildlife and the people will not be um, affected negatively by this policy thank you so much Eva. Um, any of the speakers would like to share or are you okay with me moving on with the next question i think i'll just like to talk something about Monroe because as it, it mentions the community and income so uh we believe in engaging with the community and we believe that community support is very crucial in conservation effort in the long term so like um like eva mentioned just now it's important for the community to have an income and uh because uh for in royal balloon uh for example all of these uh orang asli earns less than 500 per month we can i can easily say that it may be even less so um they are one of they are the groups that are also sort of vulnerable to become the to assist the poachers because like the you can like to be the middle guy for the poachers they are vulnerable to become that because there is money in it so there is some of like temptation there so uh to not let that happen we need to also address the issue that they need income which is important to give them jobs and to give to make sure they have enough uh yeah i think this is also another element of conservation that sometimes uh people in general don't see you need to make sure all stakeholders are happy for the environment uh for around them to be safe, for the wildlife around them to be safe. So that's all like, I just want to support Eva's point in that. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. So I'm going to go a little bit of a, um, of a order of questions because I see like, you know, there are some, um, some theme within the questions here. So let's start, you know, uh, back to your childhood. If you guys don't mind um, sharing with us, um, this, this is a question by Farah who asked, Growing up, do you have any women icons or leaders that you look up to? And what do you say to the girls and young ladies who want to take on climate advocacy road? You know, so it's not so easy. Uh, you know, feel free if anyone wants to start first, but maybe we can just um, keep it short and sweet. So maybe I... Um... Uh, growing up, I always much um, look up. No, no, growing up, as I start know about the world of conservation, I always adore Diane Fossey. You know where she she willing to to die with to conserve the gorilla species. Yeah. So she's one of the you know the icon that I always look up. And for to, for women out there that have you know that wanted to to do something in their life, like I said, um, we should not uh, we should never underestimate ourselves, and we are the one that know our limits, and never like be bothered with or afraid with other people's judgment, because the greatest prison we live is by having fear or what people think about us, you know, and we live only once so don't just don't waste your life to please uh, yeah. you just be you and unleash the wonder woman in you i totally agree because machi bawangs will not stop you know it's yeah. because they are going to ask how many a's you get when you're in school and then when you're going to get married when you're going to have babies so the questions will never stop so my as well just do you right yeah um, I, Anit and Eva, do you guys want to share who are your personal heroes? Actually, honestly, I'm growing up. I, when I think about it, I don't think I actually have any uh, personal hero. I think I can't recall anyone, but 
uh, I would say when I started conservation uh, nowadays, I would say my, uh, you can say my mentor, I would say I will look up to is our president, our organization president, that will be uh, Miss Sophia, because uh, she's actually the one that brought me, that really, you know, brought out the conservationist in me. So in a way, I respect her for that. Yeah. So that. Awesome. And um, any advice for a young lady? All right. Oh, um, yeah, I would advise. Oh, yes, uh, just like Bam said, I would have to agree with that. Yes, don't sell yourself short. You know, you don't know how we actually have so much more things that we can do. Yes, yeah, so yeah, don't listen, really listen to all these negative talks and everything. Yeah, just really believe in yourself. You know, we can achieve so much more if we have that, you know, that power of just believing in ourselves. So, yeah. Awesome. And last but not least, Anish. Mute, go. Sorry. Yeah, I, I mentioned earlier that I was actually an accidental conservationist. So before this, I have little information about what's going on. I guess growing up, um, my role, women role model have always been the women around me, my grandma, my teachers. So you can see that women have this work ethic that is exceptional. I think women, we can do it all, uh, <laughs> easy said. And um, that that's also, that, and that is still the case now that I'm working with uh, in this field. I can see so many women working relentlessly for the cause that they believe in. So it's like Eva, you said your, your, your role model is your president. So to find a role model, you don't have to go far. You can just look at the woman next to you and you find something amazing already in them. That's what I think. Yeah. And I definitely see that you guys are definitely um, role models to many women out there. Uh, I'm definitely a big fan of you guys right now, crushing really hard. So thank you so much for um, inspiring many girls out there. Um, so I, I actually get, I mean, we actually get... Uh, I, I just want to add something, Amalina. Yeah. Uh, that being said, about women being strong, being can do all, I just want to say that we, we also don't also be afraid to ask for help. That's yeah. very important. Like we all think that we can do everything, which is true, but we can also ask for help and be vulnerable and get all the support that you need. That's also very important. Yeah, I love that. Thank you so much. That's a really great uh, point. Um, I'm going to ask this question because two people have actually asked it from Ma Dewi and also from Isati. But basically, uh, the essence of the question is, um, Asking you, how do you uh, convince your family? How do your family take it when you choose to do this kind of job compared to something that would be a bit more um, well paid? Or, yeah, and according to Izati, uh, parents slash elders have the perception that being in an NGO doesn't make you um, financial, uh, it doesn't give you a financially stable life. Um, how do you face this kind of mentality and how do you actually convince them? And Bam is laughing, so I'm gonna go with Bam. No, because during my like early one or two years, because I was involved with the wildlife, going to the jungle, you know, mas utan with no coverage, I had to lie to my parents. I check out I could get zoo, so <laughs> because I don't want them to be, you know, I I'm Sabahan. I need to go to the peninsula. I don't have family. And I, I lied to them, but then when I came back for Hari Raya, I remember there's one day I showed them pictures and videos of me in the jungle. And I told them, see, I'm still survived after all this. So from there, they start read all up with what I'm I not what. And especially with all this uh, the society some more. Sometimes it is easier to ask for forgiveness than for permission. Uh, unfortunately, that's what happens to me and my parents as well. <laughs> and it's, uh, or Eva, do you guys want to add also? Yeah, during my last year of um, getting involved in like this, even my parents are actually not really that, I mean, not that they uh, very against it, but of course they did 
keep saying maybe you should look for another job you know they keep saying that but of course during my first year i was already so excited being in an ngo you know so i keep saying to them i'm i'm really happy with where i am now maybe i will i will look for another job maybe some maybe i don't know maybe next year after i'm done here i said but but then eventually slowly they start to see that okay maybe i am enjoying here as well so fine then up to you what you want to do <laughs> and ani yeah my family is still skeptical <laughs> but i guess uh it's important to to make it clear that this is what you want to do and this is what makes you happy and yeah they're their family they won't bite you they'll understand <laughs> yeah yeah definitely it's like as much as they don't approve you still a uh, uh, family you're just pushing their, your luck a lot <laughs> um okay so i have two more final questions uh, because we are going to unfortunately finish in about 10 minutes um so i want to ask you guys what is uh, you know what would you consider one of the biggest challenges that you guys are facing in the conservation field maybe we can start with anis this time Mm, I think this may be like I think the most challenging is to constantly find money to fund your projects <laughs> if I were to be blatantly honest because there's not that much money in conservation and everyone is kind of like swimming in the same little pool to get the same money which is shouldn't be happening so I, I guess this is something that need to be brought up to the policy makers as well that to take uh, conservation more seriously because it it affects us literally. So yeah, to constantly find money to find our projects and some ourselves, I suppose, to to do the projects. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, Eva, what do you think? Yes, I think it's on that one, yes. Um, money is definitely the biggest challenge for an NGO always. And yeah, that's that. <laughs> having said that, you know, it's also important for us to remember that having a fulfilling career is also something, I mean, that, yeah, I mean, maybe these girls chose to. Uh, and I, I guess it's not much about money about ourselves, it's money to fund the projects to keep the conservation work effort going. Oh, right. So it's, it's not to pay us, it's to pay the project. Okay. Yeah. So you can apply. Sorry? You guys are fine. Uh, okay, I will have there. And um, Bam, do you want to share? I totally agree with Anis and Eva. It's about the funding for the project and all. But for my side, the other challenges that I have to face is um, criticism and perspective of rehabilitating primates, where I think rehabilitating gibbons is not as hard as people said but rehabilitating human mind <laughs> to change their mindset to accept that actually wildlife need to be rehabilitated too in order to release them back to to the wild in the up to the wild with um higher chance for uh he don't, can. so changing human mindset and to educate them about the importance of rehabilitation the importance of stopping the demand for wildlife trade and to start respecting the animals in the in the wild is the challenges that i face yeah and I, and I definitely see why you don't want to hang out with humans <laughs> yeah yeah but yeah I, I do need to hang out with them sometimes to spread the awareness to hustle yeah, right. <laughs> right yeah all right <laughs> So final question, um, I think this is also important. Uh, I mean, I am interested to know about this as well. Um, one is how do you find the motivation to keep on going? I mean, despite these challenges, you know, and you guys have been working on this for quite a few years, you know, one is how do you ma uh, maintain that motivation within yourself without burning out? And second is how do you maintain? I mean, I, I see this question uh by who mean 
how do you balance between your personal life and also your conservation? Uh, and I think some people are also asking that like, because they wanted to have a life where they can have a family uh, and also like balancing that with a fulfilling career. Um, anyone wants to go first? Maybe Eva? Um, I will say um, being in a small NGO, um, it is actually quite um, very flexible in terms of time because um, we mostly work from home. Of course, occasionally we will be on the field, but um, I guess it's different in a way that we don't uh, have that uh, nine to five uh, job. But of course, also the downside is will be the in terms of um, income stability. But it is also because of this um, flexibility in your time, you actually get to uh, job, uh, look for job, uh, uh, I mean, like contract consulting job, consultation job. Like I actually myself, even though I am involved in KTCS, uh, I actually currently also employed actually um, in a research program uh, called the Blue Communities Research Program. Uh, and the study site is also happened to be in Kudat as well. So I guess that is no problem. And but of course, in uh, things like this, of course, first you need to consult with your um, employer first if whether they are OK with you still having kind of like a side job in uh, NGO as well. And as well. And fortunately, my employer right now, they are very um, supportive of that. Anis, you want to go? Yeah, sure. Uh, like uh, Eva, my NGO is very small and the working hours is very flexible. But there is also like certain uh, season where you are very busy and then a certain season where you are relaxed a bit. Then, but uh, it's always important to know your limit. So... Uh, just when you feel like it's too much on you, know yourself and take a step back and just, you know, gather yourself again. <laughs> yes, it's a bit. Awesome. And last but not least, Pa? From me, what keeps me motivated is, of course, um, one, the Gibbons, and the second one is uh, our team, our Gibbon Conservation Society and Gibbon Habitation Project team. The Gibbons is when I, we see their improvement, you know, from, from a Gibbons that is like mentally unstable, like keep on hurting themselves to, to stable. They start singing, they start, you know, playing with other Gibbons. It would keep us, keep me motivated. The second one is when my, I cannot give up when my team not giving up. So my, I really appreciate the team, the, my, my backbone uh, behind me and uh, support this project and the society. Definitely. Thank you so much. And OK, so the final ultimate question is, you know, maybe you can share with us maybe one liner about your reflection um, based on the things that you have talked about uh, or any advice you would like to impart to uh, our audience today. Um, one or two liners, uh, if you would, uh, if you like. Maybe we can start with Pam. Um, one or two lines. Um, how to say it? the end? You know, when you do start doing something, the end is not important. The important is when you the the progress. You know, you need to start it. It's better you start daripada you just berangan-angan and tak start langsung. I love that the journey of a thousand miles starts with the first step, right? Yeah, I love it. Thank you so much. And Anis, what about you? Uh. I, I think I missed your first question just now, uh, Melina, like about motivation. Just want to quickly say about that uh, and reflect on this at the same time. So uh, when we first started, we can see a lot of positive changes. I think, I guess that kept me going. We see, we heard more on the news lately about the rates by uh, Perhilitan and everything with the poachers. More poachers are being caught, more snacks are being deactivated, more people are on the ground. So that keeps us motivating, like sort of telling us that it, uh, what we're doing is working. There are changes that we're making. But that being said, I guess uh, 
in this field to make actual changes, you need the cooperation of everyone. And we are the agent of change, we ourselves and a person that we can make changes by just spreading the news, do the little that we can, everything matters. Yeah, that's all. As usual, I love, I love that. Thank you so much. And Eva, do you want to share your imparting words of wisdom? Yeah, I guess um because this event is also in conjunction with the Women's Day, International Women's Day, so I would encourage every woman to keep supporting and uplifting and up every other woman as well. Women should be supporting women, you know, not we should we shouldn't be really you know fighting with um, women with each other. So yeah, in a way, if women started working together, there are very so much more that we can achieve, um, especially in conservation field as well. So I guess that's an, uh, the final message from me. I agree. Leave the fighting to the animals that you guys are conserving. But you know, the people who are actually conserving are conserving these people. Yeah, let's stick together. So I guess that would mark the end of our panel discussion. You guys have been so amazing. Thank you so much. Um, right now, we would like to uh, request that our uh, lovely audience who are not uh, who are less shy to turn on their uh, cameras and then we will take a group photo. In the meantime, while you guys are turning on your videos and everything, would you guys mind, uh, I mean, would the speakers mind um, to share about how the participants can reach out to you if they have uh, any further questions or if unfortunately we did not get to address their questions, how can they reach out to you? Uh, Eva, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, you can reach out. Uh, we have Facebook. Uh, we are uh, on Facebook, uh, which is called Kudat Turtle Conservation Society. So yeah, you can uh, just DM us on uh, Facebook, of course, uh, you can email me as well at evavivian05 at gmail.com. But of course, maybe later the uh, Econites could uh, probably include that in uh, in your newsletter, maybe, I think. Sure. And Anis? Anis, you're muted. I always do that. Guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I guess... Uh, Econites already put our contacts in the chat so you guys can contact me more there but you guys can also personally email me at anis at rimau.ngo a-n-i-s at r-i-m-a-u dot n-g-o so yeah looking forward to your questions and last but not least Bob. Um, yeah, our you just you guys can find us at Gibbon Conservation Society, and if you want to communicate with me personally, you can find me on Instagram, Facebook, Bam Arrogancia. I I don't post much, but I I reply to messages. Yeah, so you guys don't get personal access to these people as often. So this is a great privilege. Make sure that you actually remember um, to drop them a, an email. And as Anis mentioned, you know, just don't, I mean, you know, just be very muka tempo about it. Just email people. Honestly. What the worst are, can happen? Yeah, exactly. What's the worst that can happen? You don't get a reply. Same thing if you don't even send that email. So same, same. Don't worry, you're not losing out. All right. So I see that a lot of you guys have turned on your camera. Um, there are some more people who are still shy who don't want to turn on their cameras. I really hope that you guys would consider turning on your camera so that we can take a group photo. And with that, I will leave it to um, the Econites team to direct you guys. Thank you, everyone. Hi, everyone. So we're taking the pictures now. Is it the first screen, Aini? Yeah, the first screen. Okay, so the first screen. Okay, everyone smile. Okay, now the second screen. I mean, like the second gallery. Okay, one. everyone smile. One, two. Okay, all right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Econex, for organizing this. Thank you so much, panelists for um, attending, uh, sharing your time and your experience and your stories. And most thank you importantly, for dropping by. Yes, and thank you. Most importantly, thank you to the participants, um, you know, for allowing us uh, to share our stories. Well, not really my our stories, but, you know, generally the speakers' stories. You guys have been so amazing. We love the questions. 
And yeah, we look forward to keeping in touch on the newsletters. Unanswered questions will be answered on the newsletter. Thank you. Take care. Stay Take safe. Care.